the state uh, treatment protocols uh, or revised yesterday is version 4 and actually what prompted us to revise the protocol is actually, is based on the the recent evidence and uh, this guideline the aim of this updation is to bring down the mortality in the, the highest risk groups in the state during our death audit what you come across is that definitely like uh, the, the rest of the world as well as in other parts of india during the second wave you know the compared to the first wave the mortality in uh, kerala was also higher than the first wave and then uh, in Kerala, when we do the mortality analysis, we found that 96% of the patients who die are having comorbidities. So aim of these guidelines is to somehow identify these patients at the highest risk of progression to moderate to severe disease and to intervene at the right time so as to prevent mortality in these highest risk groups, including these pregnant ladies. And also to the to give a guidance on how to tackle the complications due to COVID-19, like the infections like uh, COVID-associated aspergillosis, mucormycosis, and all. So it's around, say, 130-page uh, document. And I will uh, take you through the salient features because the you know, majority of you are aware of the basis or you know the backbone of our guidelines, and there are certain additions and certain deletions. So I uh, would like to uh, thank the, all the members of the, the State Medical Board who contributed uh, to making this uh, uh, version four? It's actually a big document, it's like a book. Uh, you know, all of you should uh, go through this uh, book in detail, especially the students and all, so that you know almost all the evidence. You know, why what uh, prompted us to include some tracks and exclude some tracks, etc., are clearly documented. You know, the modification, renal as well as hepatic, those modifications or the tracks that are put in the guidelines, etc., clearly mentioned in this guidelines. Basically, this guideline is about uh, COVID-19 stewardship. You know about antimicrobial stewardship that is using the right drug at the right time and the right dose, right patient for the right duration. Now, uh, we, we have evidence for the last one and a half years. Now, we have been tackling COVID-19 and initially there was an, uh, means there was a lot of a therapeutic misadventure. We didn't know what to do. If you're using drugs like say lopinavir, ritonavir, hydroxychloroquine, then vitamin C, acidromycin, all those stuff, convalescent plasma, etc. But in the light of the current evidence, we know that most of these drugs are actually pretty useless. They cannot prevent the COVID-19 from occurring or they cannot even prevent the progression of the disease. So that is actually therapeutic misadventurism. So now, uh, based on the current, current evidence, so we, we are in a position uh, to talk about stewardship with respect to COVID-19 as well. That is using the right drug at the right time, right duration, right dose in the right patient. So this is in short our uh, the revised guidelines the chapters there are 19 chapters the introduction case definition everything remains the same the categorization the treatment algorithm there are certain differences anticoagulation differences are there remdesivir remains the same tocilizumab remains the same one new entrant is actually the jack inhibitors that is the baricitinib as well as cofacitinib and the monoclonal antibody cocktail that is casirivimab and imdivimab for the highest risk group the adult critical care guidelines uh, has been revised in the previous guideline, we just had one page on uh, COVID-19 and pregnancy. Some, some take-home messages were there, but now, since you know pregnancy has become a concern for us with the advent of the Delta variant, we have uh, added a chapter on COVID-19 and pregnancy, and also uh, a separate session on critical care guidelines uh, in the relation to pregnancy. It has been added. The pediatric treatment guidelines, as well as the guidelines of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children has been updated. Uh, with the help of uh, another state medical board member, that is uh, Shija Suganan Madam, uh, as well as Sandur Sar, that is the ex-chairman of uh, state medical board. And we have added a chapter on COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis and uh, the mucormycosis. We had issued the guidelines separately that has been incorporated into this guideline. And we all know about the importance of uh, optimization of glycemic status in patients with diabetes and COVID-19. And also a chapter has been included on vaccine induced thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. Regarding the two new chapters, that is uh, MISA as well as uh, the TTS, we had uh, organized sessions and last week with the help of the rheumatologist Dr. Sridevi and hematologist Dr. Hida. So I won't be talking about those two chapters. And basically all of you are familiar with this uh, surveillance guidelines. Why we take you through the surveillance guidelines is that still now we are getting questions. The patient is say uh, rat negative, what should we do and all those things. And we should be very clear about this surveillance definition by NICE. 
So acute COVID-19 is signs and symptoms of COVID-19, which might persist up to one month. And ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 is symptoms persisting for one to three months. And post-COVID syndrome is actually only after three months that we are labeling the patients as a post-COVID thing. So usually what happens is that after discharge and the patient is coming back, back with dyspnea, say by day 20 or so, usually people say it is a post-COVID thing. It is not post-COVID. That is something which we should keep in mind. Post-COVID is signs and symptoms persisting for after three months from the onset of symptoms. And uh, all of you are familiar with, you know, the natural history of COVID-19. Usually we are having the phase of viral replication, which might uh, go on for say seven to eight days. And then we get the host inflammatory response. We are having an early inflammatory response as well as a hyperinflammatory response and a late inflammatory response. And by around day eight, the patients might progress to pulmonary phase and then into the stage of hyperinflammation by around day 12 or so. This is actually very, very important because the timing of all our strategies, you know, the therapeutic decision makings, uh, relies on identification of these three distinct phases of the pathogenesis of COVID-19. Now, a few hours I've seen this uh, slide, is what we are really afraid of about is the cytokine storm. So usually, you know, the patients are likely to be, to have, say, mild symptoms or so for the, the eight days or so, but Unfortunately, say 5% of the population can progress to the cytokine storm. They will progress to moderate to severe disease. And this cytokine storm is characterized by the immune dysregulation where pro-inflammatory cytokines are actually much, much more than anti-inflammatory cytokines. And there is this indecisive endotheliitis and activation of the coagulation cascade. So all the treatments which are shown to uh, have a mortality benefit in the, in the treatment of COVID-19, that is the steroids, as well as cetocilizumab, and anticoagulation are to be administered in this in this period. So administering the, uh, these drugs, that is immunomodulators, before the onset of this, uh, yeah, uh, this hypoxia can be detrimental to the patient. That is why we were uh, focusing on this divorce, that is the right drug at the right time. This right time is important. So in order to identify the right time at, at which we should inter intervene, it's very important that we know about the concepts of the viral replication as well as when this cytokine storm is going to occur. And this is actually, all of you are familiar with this thing, the Rajesh Gandhi's uh, uh, this, uh, the slides which are published in NEGM. So at what point, what drug you should be considering? So if you are thinking about using say monoclonal antibodies, so it is as a preemptive therapy, that is before hypoxia is setting in, that is very, very important. That is early in the disease course, we should be using this Casarivimab and Imdimab cocktail, that is before the patient progress to hypoxia. That actually applies to the antivirals as well. So, Remdesivir, we know that uh, the indication for using Remdesivir is when the patient is developing hypoxia. And from the symptom onset, it should be less than 10 days. That we should keep in mind. And the immunomodulators, like the steroids, tocilizumab, and the JAK inhibitors, like say baricitinib and tofacitinib, should be used when the patient is developing hypoxia only. So we should not be using it during the, the phase of viral replication. So we should keep this chart in mind. And the treatment strategy uh, of COVID-19, as per the revised guidelines, is definitely the most important thing. The most important uh, intervention which can bring down the mortality is definitely going to be the aggressive vaccination. There is to, no question about that. So vaccination is the, the, the earliest intervention or the most important intervention which can bring down the mortality in COVID-19 is obviously vaccination. So after that, the highest risk group the PMD therapy with this monoclonal antibody cocktail. So what is licensed in India is Casarivimab plus Imdivimab. When we are administering it to the highest risk category, it can actually bring down the hospitalization by around 70 percent. Okay. So what do you mean by this PMD therapy? PMD therapy means that so it should be administered before hypoxia develops. That is, it should be administered as early as possible. Ideally, even though we say. Ideally, it has to be administered before hypoxia sets in, before, say, 10 days from symptom onset. It has to be administered as early as possible. So, suppose a chronic kidney disease patient is complaining of rhinitis, test them at the earliest. If they are COVID positive, we know that in CKD, the outcomes, uh, as far as Kerala is concerned, say, around, say, 30% mortality is there, especially in CKD patients on maintenance hemodialysis. So, one strategy which can actually prevent the progression to moderate to severe disease is administration of Casarivimab plus Imdivimab cocktail at the right time. And this is about TMD therapy. So then uh, this, uh, as far as the recovery trial goes, the high dose of Casarivimab and Imdivimab 
has been found to have mortality benefit in patients with hypoxia, also on NIV, et cetera. But then that is four gram uh, uh, casirumab plus four gram imidumab dose has not been licensed in India by CDSO, CDSCO and DCGI. So in our guidelines, when we talk about casirumab, imidumab cocktail, we are talking only about pre-MD therapy. We are not going to talk about monoclonal antibody in the treatment of hypoxic individuals. Next aspect is actually definitely therapy with antivirus. That's remdesivir. We know that you no know, the other drugs like say ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, fibrinavir, etc. Despite one and a half years, there is no evidence uh, to suggest that it can actually prevent the progression to moderate to severe disease or can bring in any sort of mortality benefit. Remdesivir also the data is not very strong, but of the antivirus, remdesivir is the one because one there is one very good uh, RCT supporting. Uh, uh, the remedies were used in hypoxic individuals which states that it can bring down the hospital stay, the ICU stay by around three days. So if you're thinking about using a, an antiviral, it has to be remedies only in patients who are hypoxic and, and if they are present within 10 days of symptom onset. The backbone obviously is going to be immunomodulators, that is steroids, JAK inhibitors and tocilizumab. And anticoagulation is also very, very important and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the right dose of anticoagulation at the right time for the right duration Actually, it goes a lot into saving lives of patients. The next aspect is the treatment of uh, complications, uh, which are not only ARDS and things like that, voluntary embolism and all, but also the complications which can occur later on, like COVID associated voluntary aspergillosis, mucormycosis, MISC, MISC, etc. The treatment depends on the risk stratification, the severity staging, as well as the drug availability. So, clinical categorizations, all of you are familiar with ABC, there is no change in that. And uh, regarding the severity staging, mild, moderate, severe remains the same. We have included the critical also, that is requirement for high level respiratory support that is, uh, you know, NIV or HFNO more than 20 liters per minute, invasive mechanical ventilation, ARDS, septic shock, etc. Because, you know, just for, uh, you know, when you come to the anticoagulation session, anticoagulation for moderate, severe and critical the recommendations are a bit different. That is why, you know, we have uh, brought in the definition of critical particularly also into this guidelines. The risk stratification actually remains the same. The risk stratification is actually very, very important because if you want to bring down the mortality, we need to identify patients with risk factors, uh, which uh, you know, uh, in whom the outcomes are likely to be bad. And we should ensure that the patients with risk factors, like say uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension, cardiovascular disease, pre-existing pulmonary disease, CKD, CLD, et cetera. So they should not be in home care. They should be ad ad admitted. If they continue to be in home uh, care, we should ensure that we are able to monitor them and they're having access to pulse oximeter, et cetera. So what you've seen is that those patients without say glucometer at home, once they are getting COVID-19, you know, the you know, their sugar levels go totally uncontrolled and then the risk of getting COVID associated mucormycosis, et cetera, is pretty, pretty high. The clinical assessment aspect, the hypoxia, SPO less than 94%, tachycardia more than 110, the respiratory rate, hypertension, everything remains the same. And the lab values, which are predictors of, uh, you know, progression to severe disease, there's CRP more than 100, say D-dimer more than 1000, LDH more than 245, Fertin more than 300, all these things actually remain the same as in the previous guideline. Now there is uh, one session, we know that there has been a chapter on how to interpret the CT reports as a correct scoring and a CT severity index, et cetera, are different, but then there is no change with, with respect to the previous guideline. The one change is that, you no. Know, we have introduced the concept of radiological stewardship. Always the question is that when should CT scan be taken? Should all the hospitalized patients be uh, sent for CT scanning, etc.? So the, the basic question is why routine HRCT imaging of chest in COVID-19 patients is not recommended? It's because nearly two thirds of persons with asymptomatic COVID-19 have abnormalities in HRCT chest imaging, which are non-specific, and most of them do not progress clinically. HRG CT imaging done in the first week of illness might underestimate the extent of lung involvement because usually the cytokine storm will kick in by around day eight. And if suppose you do the CT on day three and say it is normal, it does not mean anything. Correlation between extent of lung involvement by HRCT imaging of chest and hypoxia is imperfect. Repeated radiation exposure from HRCT imaging can pose radiation hazard. So HRCT imaging should be considered only if indicated. Now, what are the indications? What are the appropriate clinical indications for HRCT imaging of chest in COVID-19 patients? So this actually should be reserved for suspected confirmed uh, cases of moderate to severe COVID-19 who progressively deteriorate despite optimal therapy. So we, are, we should order an HRCT uh, thorax along with CT and geo to look for pulmonary embolism 
or to rule out invasive bacterial infection like kappa or covid associated mycomycosis and there is a that category of this pcr negative sars cov2 bronco pneumonia uh, which is actually identified by taking an hrct thorax and looking at the coral staging and as part of pulmonary rehabilitation program probably the ct uh, chest will help to assess the extent of lung damage and this is actually the treatment uh, guidelines in a nutshell we are dividing the patients into uh, the category a b and c for category a we require only symptomatic treatment so symptomatic treatment uh, is paracetamol and cetirizine like that or saline gargland or symptomatic treatment is not about giving azithromycin or say vitamin c or uh, a thing etc because no there are enough and more studies to show that the antibiotics we is a viral list is antibiotics have absolutely no role as well as vitamins are not going to prevent the progression to severity so symptomatic treatment is about using uh, paracetamol or cetirizine even though these patients uh, you know we are not starting them on any drugs the most important aspect is that we should monitor them uh, we should ask them to monitor themselves or we should monitor them every 24 to 48 hours to assess whether there is any change in category from category a to category b they should be monitored for dyspnea hypoxia high grade fever severe cough altered sensorium and excessive fatigability any or any of these red flag signs are present they should immediately be hospitalized the categorization should be reassessed every 24 to 48 hours and ideally they should maintain all the patients if they are in home care should be uh, you know look at uh, maintain a chart of the respiratory rate the spo2 single breath count if they don't have access to a pulse oximeter in category b so previously uh, we had is ivermectin in this category so I, we have taken away ivermectin because of lack of high quality evidence so category b patients uh, that is those with comorbidities and those, those with symptoms and comorbidities so if they are having fever and cough for say 5 days they should be started on say bedisonide 800 microgram twice a day this is just like in the previous guideline and should be continued for around say 5 to 7 days and these patients also should be constantly monitored every say 24 hours and they should have a chart of the respiratory rate and say a saturation and if they don't have access to a oximeter so single breath count the category c patients also if they don't have hypoxia they should be started on say bedisonide Agent BD, if they are having symptoms, fever and cough for say five days or so, and if they are having hypoxia, so then we divide them into say moderate and severe category. So moderate is SpO2 say less than 94 and between 91 to 94 on room air, and respiratory rate between 24 and 29. Severe is the SpO2 less than 90 and respiratory rate more than 30. So they should be start on started on steroids. That is the uh, the dose of steroids remain the same as in the previous guideline. So for moderate CBRT, dexamethasone 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg per day for five to ten days, and for uh, now, and if it is medium bread, the dose is say 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg per day for five to ten days. In severe disease, uh, uh, is the dose is doubled, dexa 0.2 to 0.4 and medium prednisone 1 to 2 milligram per kilogram per day. This is actually a slight deviation from what is uh, recommended by say WHO, NIH, etc., where they stick on to the recovery trial dose of dexamethasone 6 milligram. per day for uh, 6 mg per day for moderate to severe disease we have actually stuck on with the previous guidelines because you now uh, we believe that 6 mg may not work for all patients so ideally the lowest possible dose of steroids which can bring down the inflammation which can prevent hypoxia should be our aim because you know we know that steroids do have side effects and especially in diabetic patients uh, the controlling the blood sugar levels etc also is of paramount importance then the second uh, major intervention which which is having a mortality benefit is anticoagulation we will discuss about that in detail then uh, as part of emergency use authorization all patients with hypoxia we can consider remdesivir uh, in moderate to severe disease within 10 days of symptom onset the the patient should not be having uh, say a gfr less than 30 or a is an scpt more than 5 times the upper limit of normal but these are not absolute contraindications especially in ckd patients remdesivir for 5 days are not going to is not going to do any harm if the lft is actually normal but then you need to have an institutional medical board approval for the same so institutional medical board means all the treating hospitals should be having an institutional medical board and ckd patient is there and is hypoxic and within 10 days and if you feel that the patient is likely to benefit from remdesivir look at the lft if the lft is normal they can actually be started on remdesivir so recommended dose and all everyone knows and tocilizumab there is no change with regard to the previous uh, guidelines but we know that tocilizumab the therapeutic window of opportunity is actually very limited it should not be started pretty early it should not be started pretty late if started at the right time so it is actually a wonderful drug with mortality benefit so when should tocilizumab be started 
So uh, it should be started is actually to block the interleukin-6 related pro-inflammatory cytokine release. Okay, should be started for all patients with severe disease, not for moderate disease. Severe disease, preferably within 24 to 48 hours of onset of severe disease for ICU admission. The patient should be having raised uh, inflammatory markers, either CRP more than 75 milligram per liter is a recovery trial cutoff or a raised IL-6 level. And the patient should not be improving despite use of steroids. That is a sick patient uh, is coming to your ICU is either on HFNO or NIV or some mechanical ventilation. So, and you are using the therapeutic dose of steroids for say 24 hours when the patient is, is, uh, is deteriorating and the requirement is a favor is 0.4 and HFNO 30 liters per minute. So if that is a requirement and the patient is not improving despite use of steroids or, or if there is a clinical worsening with a very high CRP levels, then you can consider using tocilizumab. But you should know that it is a double-edged sword and, and the patient should not be having any active bacterial, fungal or tubercular infection. Now coming to the an addition uh, uh, to this guideline is the use of this JAK inhibitors in COVID-19, that is varicetinib and tofacetinib. We will discuss about that in detail in the, in the coming slides. So the indication is any patient with a diagnosed COVID infection with say moderate to severe disease should be considered only for patients who have not received tocilizumab or on mechanical ventilation. So should be limited to those patients who require eight liters per minute of oxygen or FAO2 more than 0.4 or higher levels of respiratory support for at least eight hours. And it's not improving despite 24 hours of standard care, including dexamethasone, methoprednisone. So basically those patients with moderate or severe disease who have been started on say, therapeutic dose of steroids and patients who uh, are not improving despite the, uh, the, the therapeutic dose of steroids and require say fair to at least 0.4 uh, or 8 liters per minute of oxygen, they can be started on baricetinib or tofacetinib. They are JAK inhibitors. In rare circumstances, certain cases you will not be able to use steroids, like say the patient is in say DKA or an altered sensorium, patient is having say history of a GI bleed or an active ulcer, etc. You may not be able to use steroids. In such situation, baricetinib or tofacetinib may be used for treatment of COVID-19 in hospitalized, non-intubated patients who require oxygen supplementation. So uh, when we look at our scenario, so we usually start with say low dose of steroids, say, say six milligram OD or, or say methoprenis 40 milligram OD. But then usually if the hypoxia is not improving, inflammatory markers are serially increasing. There is a tendency of us to increase the dose of steroids to, to say semidepinicillam, say two milligram per kilogram per day. And certain centers know further increases are made, like say semidepinicillam, 125 milligram, 8 early, 250 milligram, 8 early. The problem here is that these are not you know, the doses recommended, but we are using it because uh, we don't want the patient to progress to invasive mechanical ventilation where the outcomes are not likely to be. Uh, pretty good. So that is why, you know, the, 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 the doctors tend to hike the dose of steroids. What happens is that then it becomes very difficult to control the blood sugar levels. We know that uncontrolled blood sugar levels are independent predictors of mortality in COVID-19. That is one situation where, you know, the bar, addition of baricetinib is going to help you. That is, we can uh, stick on to the standard dose of steroids. And then if you want add, additional in, uh, in, uh, this, uh, immunosuppression, you can think about adding baricetinib. Just like tocilizumab, we should be sure that there should not be any evidence of active tuberculosis, fungal or bacterial infection. And the dose of baricetinib is four milligram once a day for seven to 14 days. And tofacetinib, the dose is 10 milligram BD for seven to 14 days. Just like tocilizumab, baricetinib and tofacetinib actually should not be used in pregnancy and uh, say <clears throat> breastfeeding. So it should be considered only if you know, the benefit far outweighs the potential risk due to the tocilizumab or baricetinib, tofacetinib. Having said that, in pregnancy, we do use tocilizumab if the, if the response to steroids is not actually pretty good, especially in those uh, patients uh, who are on HFNO, NIV, and uh, you know, the oxygen requirements are going up with very high CRP levels. So we want to use tocilizumab in pregnancy. You need to get the, the approval of the Institutional Medical Board, and you need to have a, it's, it's used as, you know, on a compassionate basis, so you need to have informed consent from the patient. Now coming to uh, in the, in the administration of monoclonal antibodies, that is the, the monoclonal antibody cocktail uh, you know, approved for use in India by uh, DCGIE, Kassirivimab and MDBMAP. Okay, these are IgG1, which will bind to two separate epitopes in the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2. The aim of administration of these monoclonal antibodies is to prevent disease progression in highest risk groups. It is not higher risk groups, it is the highest risk groups. So it has to be administered early in the disease course before hypoxia develops. That is what I meant by pre therapy. 
it should not be administered in those who require oxygen therapy due to covid-19 or those who are on chronic oxygen therapy due to an underlying non covid related comorbidity like a copd and because of covid-19 if the there has been increase in oxygen flow rate from baseline suppose in a copd patient is there uh, has been diagnosed with covid-19 patient is on say home oxygen and usually uh, the, in the patient saturation may be around say 90 percentage on home oxygen suppose <coughs> it remains at 90 percentage you can administer monoclonal antibodies okay but suppose after occurrence of covid 19 the saturation has dipped to say around 85 percentage then it's a contraindication to preemptive use of monoclonal antibodies it should not be administered more than 10 days from symptom onset and one thing we should keep in mind when we talk about uh, you know a uh, covid uh, stewardship we we should uh, we sh <coughs> the current evidence show that there is no role for use of zinc vitamin c or azithromycin so they have no evidence based role in the treatment or prevention of covid 19 infection and we should actually should not be prescribing azithromycin right and left because it will contribute to a far bigger menace than covid 19 that is antimicrobial resistance and in patients who are hospitalized we should also focus on infection prevention control activities as well as antibody stewardship to optimize clinical outcomes in critically ill because uh, all those who have treated critically ill patients do agree that one major contribution of mortality is uh, infections due to uh, drug resistant organisms and one word about uh, inhaled budesonide so the evidence for uh, using inhaled budesonide in uh, patients with comorbidities with fever and cough for say 3 to 5 days comes from this principal trial where it showed that the using this budesonide 800 milli microgram bd has a, can reduce the time to recovery by median of 3 days in people with covid-19 with risk factors for adverse outcomes now this is actually the criteria for using uh, tocilizumab uh, following the remap cap and the recovery uh, trial results that is as discussed it has to, the therapeutic window of opportunity is actually limited it has to be started in recently hospitalized patients who have been admitted to icu within the prior 24 hours and who require invasive mechanical ventilation niv or hfno that is the fao2 should be more than 0.4 and the oxygen requirement flow rate should be 30 to liter 30 liter per minute so if the patient uh, satisfies this criteria they should be started on intravenous tocilizumab and alternatively subcutaneous tocilizumab which may take more time to act or the second indication is recently hospitalized patients with rapidly increasing oxygen needs who require niv or hfno and have significantly increased markers of inflammation this crp more than 75 mg per liter or you can also rely on il6 if you do have access to il6 the dose is 8 mg per kg iv maximum 800 mg usually uh, a single dose is given and if the uh, if the you know <coughs> the response to a single dose is uh, not adequate you can uh, decide about giving a second dose as well the contraindication for tocilizumab is a gfr less than 30 and uh, patients with uh, transaminate is more than uh, three times the upper limit of normal and it should be used with caution in patients with increased risk of ga perforation use in pregnant patients must be based on a case by case basis with additional discussion approval from the the uh, means institutional medical board so the relative contraindications are uh, scpt more than three times upper limit of normal neutropenia thrombocytopenia evidence of active tuberculosis active uh, fungal or bacterial infection so all those patients you have started on tocilizumab and who do recover you should keep them under your follow up for same months because there is always a possibility of a reactivation of tuberculosis or occurrence of tuberculosis or occurrence of fungal infections candidemia uh, kappa or covid associated mycomycosis now coming to this uh, the monoclonal antibodies we have discussed that this monoclonal antibody cocktail casirumab and imdivimab is actually used as a preemptive therapy that is the patient uh, before the patient develop hypoxia so this is actually from the, <laughs> the active platform which uh, looks at active is a platform by uh, you know uh, <coughs> nih which actually looks at the outpatient treatment of uh, uh, <coughs> covid 19 looking at therapeutic options to given to outpatients which can uh, prevent hospitalization if you look at the drugs being studied under this uh, protocol uh, you can see that majority of the drugs happen to be the monoclonal antibody cocktails of of uh, of the monoclonal antibody cocktails uh, the <coughs> the how they act is you can see that the first one to get approval was uh, bevlanimab in usa so this is the bevlanimab then the, the bevlanimab plus etesimumab came into the market in usa and it also got emergency use authorization and then this casirumab plus imdivimab 600 mg 600 mg and recently sotrovimab also got uh, us fda approval of of the this monoclonal antibody cocktails 
cocktails. Initially, the bubble anima monotherapy was there, but because of the the, the prevalence of resistant SARS-CoV-2 variants, it's because of E484K, uh, the mutation which was uh, present in the RBD in the beta as well as gamma, in South African as well as the Brazil variants. So the bevilanimab was not able to as a neutralize that, those variants. So bevilanimab monotherapy in the US uh, FDA did revoke the EUA granted to bevilanimab monotherapy. So what is left is uh, uh, these combinations of which uh, the one which uh, retains activity against Delta variable is Casrimab plus MDBMAP. The uh, because uh, you know in the K417 mutation can can render the can uh, uh, sort of minimize the neutralizing ability of Casrimab, but it is it does not touch MDBMAP. So against the Delta variant, also this monoclonal antibody Casrimab and MDBMAP, which is approved in India, is found to be useful. Now, how does this uh, the monoclonal antibodies work? So what it does is you know about the, the spike protein as well as the receptor binding domains. There are multiple epitopes. So the casirumab as well as imdivimab, they are IgG1, humanized monoclonal antibodies. They will bind to different sites in the different epitopes in the, in the receptor binding domain. So what happens is that once you know, uh, the casirumab and imdivimab bind, binds to these epitopes, then the virus won't be able to attach to the AC2 receptor. So it can bring down the viral load drastically. Okay, that is how it prevents the disease progression in those with the highest risk. Risk is very, very important. Why two monoclonal antibodies are used? Because if one antibody is used, just like bevilanimab, the mutations can probably render them useless. That is why always a, a combination is preferred nowadays, because if one fails, the other will work. For example, casirumab against Delta is not a very, very strong option, but, but imdivimab retains its neutralizing activity. So the combination definitely works. Suppose the virus has already attached to the, the host cells and uh, has uh, endocytosis has occurred. Then also, this monoclonal antibody can bind to the virus expressed on the host cell surface and can uh, lead to the apoptosis and necrosis of the infected cell uh, through antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis and complement dependent cytotoxicity. This is actually the mechanism of action of SRVMAP and MDMAP as well as other monoclonal antibodies. Now, in India, the uh, the DCGA has uh, given uh, emergency use approval for 600 milligram plus 600 milligram combination of SRMAP and MDMAP. And what is available with us as of now is one vial, uh, uh, a single dose vial will contain 1,200 milligram of SRMAP and 1,200 milligram of MDMAP in the second vial. Okay, so we require only half the dose because the dose uh, approved in India is 600 milligram, 600 milligram. Initially in USA, the 1,200 milligram was approved. And uh, recently, USFD has approved the 600 milligram dose as well. It can be administered uh, intravenously or in a subcutaneous fashion. The most important thing is that it is a very costly option. So, because you know, 600 milligram of uh, and, uh, the Casirima MDMAB is going to cost you 60,000 rupees. So, we need to, in order to bring down the number needed to treat to prevent one hospitalization, we need to handpick the patients pretty carefully. We need to identify those patients who if they develop COVID-19 are likely to progress to severe disease and are likely to expire due to COVID-19. Only then we will be able to justify the use of such a costly molecule as a preemptive therapy. So as per our guidelines, the high risk individuals who will benefit from monoclonal antibody cocktail are those with a body mass index more than 35, a chronic kidney disease with EGFR less than 60 or those who are on maintenance hemodialysis, diabetes smelters with hb one more than 10 or those with evidence of end organ damage, chronic liver disease, immunocompromising conditions, those who are on immunosuppressive treatment, patients above 65 years, cardiovascular disease, those with chronic respiratory disease like COPD, malignancies with chance of survival, and other indications as deemed fit by the institutional medical board. So it's very, very important. So if you look at, uh, if you go through this uh, <coughs> listing, you can see that these are the patients you know, who account for the majority of the people who have died in Kerala during the second wave. That is why we have targeted this population for administration of early administration of monoclonal antibody cocktail. We don't want them to progress to hypoxia. So the, this monoclonal antibody should be administered only to uh, uh, the persons about 12 years of age and those with 40 kilograms. In the, in the age bracket of 12 to 17 years, in those with a BMI more than 85 percentage for their age and gender, the antibody cocktail may be considered in those with sickle cell disease, congenital or acute heart disease, neurodevelopment disorders like cerebral palsy, 
uh, or a medical related uh, technological dependence that is not related to COVID-19 like those on tracheostomy, gastrostomy, positive pressure ventilation, asthmatics and those with reactive airway disease. So basically, if you want to justify the use of this monoclonal antibody cocktail, the most important thing is that we need to identify those with the highest risk of progression to hypoxia. So what are the contraindications to use of these monoclonal antibodies? Aim of administration of uh, monoclonal antibodies is to prevent disease progression. So it has to be administered early in the disease course before hypoxia develops. It should not be administered in those who require oxygen therapy due to COVID-19 or those who are on chronic oxygen therapy due to an underlying non-COVID related comorbidity like COPD. And because of COVID-19, there has been an increase in uh, oxygen requirement. And if the patient has presented to you more than 10 days from symptom onset, is also a contraindication for administration of monoclonal antibody cocktail. A renal impairment, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this monoclonal antibodies are not eliminated intact in urine. This renal impairment is not expected to affect the exposure to s map and md map. Regarding hepatic impairment, it's not a contraindication, but then the effect of uh, this hepatic impairment on the pharmacokinetics of this monoclonal antibody is not known, but hepatic impairment is not a contraindication. Now, coming come to the most important aspect, whether it can be administered in pregnancy, we know that IgG1, uh, uh, this thing is an IgG1 product, it can cross the, the placental barrier, and so the tesserimab and imdumab have the potential to be transferred from the mother to the developing fetus. So it is unknown whether the potential transfer of tesserimab and imdumab provides any treatment benefit or risk to the developing fetus. So pregnancy is not an absolute contraindication. It can be used as a compassionate ground after getting approval from the institutional medical board. Because suppose you are having an obese, uh, say BMI is more than 35, a lady with uh, gestational diabetes, mellitus, preeclampsia, we know that if that patient progress to hypoxia, then the chances of them surviving is actually pretty low. So we yeah, need to identify uh, the pregnant ladies with very high risk factors of disease progression. And in that category, after getting the approval of the institutional medical board and getting an informed consent from the patient, you can administer this monoclonal antibody cocktail. And whether the most important uh, the question is whether, you know, uh, you know uh, this thing, the casirumab and imdumab is effective against the Delta variant. The studies, uh, this was recently published in uh, the journal Cell this month. Uh, the study shows that the region code, that is actually the name for the origin, origin Roche molecule for this casirumab and imdumab cocktail, retains the neutralization potency against the current variants of concern or interest, including the Delta variant. Now coming to the, the next new addition, that is the JAK inhibitors. JAK inhibitors is Janus kinase inhibitor. So what does this do? We know that the mechanism action of tocilizumab is actually blocking the IL-6 receptor, okay? So interleukin-6 is, is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. You can say that uh, <coughs> this is actually, the rise in IL-6 can be taken as uh, a surrogate marker of the, the cytokine stock. So that what the tocilizumab does is so it blocks the IL-6 receptor. So this IL-6, this is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, IL-6, and other pro-inflammatory cytokines actually act through the, the JAK pathway or the JAK or the STAT pathway. What this Janus kinase inhibitors, like say baricitinib or tofacitinib does is, it inhibits the phosphorylation of the proteins which take part in the JAK as well as the STAT pathway. That is the STAT uh, stands for signal, trans uh, signal transcription and activation of transcription. So this uh, JAK inhibitors as well as the block the STAT pathway and this actually can uh, result in toning down the inflammatory response because this activation of the STAT pathway and the JAK pathway is important for acute phase response, T cell differentiation, lymphocyte growth and differentiation and lymphocyte effector function. So it actually acts a bit lower down than where, where, where this tocilizumab acts. The advantages, advantage of this JAK inhibitors is oral and it's not is compared to tocilizumab, which costs say 30,000 rupees per injection per dose, the baricitinib and the tofacitinib, uh, the entire treatment cost, if, even if you are using the uh, means the, uh, the molecule with the maximum price in the market, it will be less than 1,000 for 14 day course. Okay, so that is, it can be taken orally as well. What are the indications for using uh, baricitinib or tofacitinib? Uh, indications are for diagnosed COVID 19 infection should be considered only for patients who have not received tocilizumab or uh, on mechanical ventilation. Patients who require at least 8 liter per minute of oxygen with a to more than 0.4 or higher levels of respiratory support for at least 8 hours 
and are not improving despite 24 hours of standard care, including dexamethasone. In rare circumstances when steroids cannot be used also, baricitinib can be considered. In uh, <coughs> the effect of uh, the barrier or TOFA on pregnancy is not known. So as of now, it should be considered in pregnancy only if the, the benefits due to uh, a barrier will outweigh the, the risk due to baricitinib. Dose as discussed, 4 milligram hourly daily barrier and TOFA is 10 milligram BD. Uh, duration is around 7 to 14 days for both. So before you are starting uh, these JAK inhibitors, you should know the hemogram, you should know the transaminase as well as the, the EGFR. It's very, very important. So what are the contraindications? <clears throat> In patients with an absolute lymphocyte count less than 500, neutrophil count less than 1,000, hemoglobin less than 8, it is contraindicated because it can lead to marrow suppression. If there is evidence of active uh, infections, including localized infection, it should not be used. It should be avoided in active tuberculosis. It should not be combined with potent immunosuppressants like tocilizumab, cyclosporin, azathioprine, etc. <laughs> uh, and uh, these DAC inhibitors uh, means other than COVID-19, routinely use the rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, pregnancy and lactation is a contraindication, and uh, those on hemodialysis, ESRD, the EGFR less than 15 is a contraindication. And tofacitinib can lead to uh, this is not applicable to Barry. TOFA can lead to PR prolongation. So it should be used with caution in patients with a heart rate less than 60 beats per minute or patients are having other conduction uh, disturbances. Uh, uh, Syncoparathmia, ischemic heart disease or heart failure. So you know that this remdesivir can also lead to bradycardia. So ideally, uh, you should not be combining remdesivir with tofacitinib if there is bradycardia. If the, the heart rate is less than 60, try to avoid tofacitinib. Now, coming to the dosing of Barry in the renal environment, so EGFR more than 60, no dose adjustment is 4 gram, four milligram per day can be used. Between 30 and 60, decrease to 2 milligram per day. Between 15 and 30, decrease to 1 milligram. If it is less than 15, or patients on dialysis, etc., try to avoid using Barry. And the same thing applies to TOFA as well. Mild environment, no dose adjustment. Moderate to severe environment, uh, bring down the dose to 5 milligram BD. Now, dosing in hepatic environment also, uh, 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 means uh, mild to moderate, no dose adjustment is required. If severe, now use is actually not recommended. Okay, so you should monitor for increase uh, uh, for drug induced liver injury when the patient is on baricitinib or tofacitinib, and if the STBD is more than three times and it is serially rising, try to avoid using this drug. Now uh, the adverse reactions uh, other than hypersensitivity. This JAK inhibitors can lead to serious infections, including bacterial, viral, invasive, fungal, and, and other opportunistic infections. So all these patients who have been on Barry and TOFA, you need to follow them for a, a long period of time. If serious infections are suspected, JAK inhibitors should be discontinued immediately. And with baricitinib, there is a risk of arterial and venous thrombosis, including pulmonary embolism. So all the patients on JAK inhibitors ideally should be on anticoagulation as well. The elevation of uh, transaminase, the, the risk of GA per, uh, perforation is there, even though the exact cause is not, is not known. So just like uh, uh, <coughs> tocilizumab, JAK inhibitor should be used with caution in patients with the risk of perforation like those with diabetic colitis. The reactivation of herpes zoster is around 7.5 to 2 fold higher in, than in general population. And also, uh, you can have disseminated herpes simplex, etc. in those patients who are on JAK inhibitors. And uh, there is a likelihood of CPK elevation as uh, the IL-6 can block the differentiation of myoblasts into mature myocytes. And with baricitinib, thrombocytosis can occur. And platelet count can increase by 50,000 peak by around, say, week two, because, you know, all this data is taken by the experience of rheumatoid arthritis. That is why they say by around week two, because in COVID, we are going to use it only for, say, 7 to 14 days. And tofacitinib can lead to the thrombocytopenia. So when you are using baricitinib, the problem is that uh, baricitinib, since it is an oral drug, which is likely that we are we may end up misusing the drug. So we should be very careful when we are using baricitinib because just like tocilizumab, you can have all these complications and we should be knowing the entire list of complications when we are using immunomodulators like uh, tocilizumab and uh, baricitinib. So drug interactions are also a concern with, uh, say, baricitinib, uh, like uh, I mean, so those with the strong organic anion transporters or three inhibitors like probenicid, but then it's not being used in COVID-19 and all. It's not a frequently used drug, so it's not a problem at all. And we are using TOFA. It should be reduced when we are using strong CYP3A for inhibitors like, say, ketoconazole or fluconazole. And it should not be co-administered with CYP3A for inhibitors like rifampicin. 
and most important aspect is that bari or tofa should not be administered in patients who have recent tocilizumab and baricitinib and tofacitinib should be given only in hospitalized patients don't discharge the patient on baricitinib or tofacitinib uh, this algorithm we are retaining this algorithm uh, that is when to use the steroids steroids uh, still remain our uh, most potent weapon steroids uh, should not be uh, uh, administered uh, <coughs> it should not be administered early or it should not be administered too late so the the, the point where we should be uh, giving steroids is when the patient is having exertional desaturation uh, we should not wait till the patient go uh, go, go to drastic desaturation as the 94 so all the patients should be advised you now if they are not having any contraindication to undergo in the 6 minute walk test you now at their own pace they should be advised to walk for 6 minutes and see whether there is a fall in saturation by 3 percentage suppose the saturation is 97 and after walking for 6 minutes if the saturation falls to 95 so 94 or 95 then it means that there is an interstitial damage and such patients will actually benefit from early uh, <coughs> administration of steroids now uh, coming to the most important aspect and where certain changes are there the pathophysiology of covid associated coagulopathy or covid associated hemostatic abnormalities and the previous guidelines uh, we, we said that for covid 19 patients with moderate to severe disease evidence from the remap cap attack and acti4 trials recommend the use of prophylactic dose anticoagulation or intermediate or higher intensity anticoagulation actually uh, a couple of days back Uh, the trial got published in NEGM where you know the take on uh, in the, the outcome was in patients with moderate to severe disease actually the therapeutic dose anticoagulation from this ACT4 trial etc was found to be uh, better than this prophylactic dose anticoagulation so 1000 patients with hypoxia administered therapeutic dose anticoagulation it could actually prevent the death in 40 uh, persons but there was an increased uh, risk of bleeding around 7 percentage so the current recommendation so the trial show that for those with moderate to severe disease therapeutic dose anticoagulation might be better than prophylactic dose anticoagulation the previous uh, version 3 said that therapeutic dose anticoagulation should be reserved only for patients with suspected or proven venous or arterial thrombosis so the uh, the current recommendations are that in all hospitalized patients and moderate severe or critical categories there is a strong recommendation for at least prophylactic dose anticoagulation in mild category anticoagulation should be individualized based on the risk factor assessment and standard hospital practice so in patients without hypoxia we cannot uh, means uh, uh, <coughs> give any recommendation for or against the rapid dose of anticoagulation in hospitalized patients but uh, they might benefit from prophylactic dose of anticoagulants the most important thing is that for hospitalized with moderate illness for, for moderate severity so there is a conditional recommendation for therapeutic dose anticoagulation in patients with progressive increasing oxygen requirement previously we used to say prophylactic now for moderate and severe illness you go with therapeutic dose anticoagulation why this change came about is because when all the trials were you know analyzed before the recent active four got published in nigm uh, there was not uh, any mortality benefit with therapeutic dose anticoagulation or prophylactic dose anticoagulation but then it could actually prevent the occurrence of thrombosis by around say 37 to 40 percent each whereas the the risk of major bleeding was only around say 7 percent the problem is that in, in majority of the icus we may not be able to pick up this uh, thrombosis if the patient is on niv or say uh, is a, uh, has been ventilated so if you are not able to uh, pick up this thrombosis then this study is on apply we will be able to pick up the major bleed that is why you know the current recommendation states that for moderate to severe illness it is better to go with therapeutic dose anticoagulation instead of prophylactic dose anticoagulation whereas for critical illness we cannot make such a recommendation so it is up to the clinician whether to use the prophylactic dose anticoagulation or therapeutic dose anticoagulation you need to uh, weigh the risk of uh, bleeding due to therapeutic anticoagulation versus the risk of thrombosis when the patient is on prophylactic dose anticoagulation in this critical illness category but for uh, moderate and severe there is no doubt go with therapeutic dose anticoagulation now uh, what do you mean by this prophylactic dose anticoagulation for the, all the hospitalized patients we would, would like uh, them to be on either low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin the dose uh, prophylactic dose for low molecular weight heparin is 40 mg uh, od and if the weight is more than 4 uh, 40 <coughs> and the bma is more than 40 you uh, go with 40 mg bd unfractionated heparin 5000 uh, unit uh, bd or, or bmi if it is more than uh, 40 7500 units bd Uh, if we are using noax there is a <coughs> noax for a, as a on prophylactic dose apixaban is 2.5 mg bd rivaroxaban is 10 mg od 
if we are using Honda Paranax, it is 2.5 milligram sub-Q OD and Daltiparin 5,000 OD sub-Q OD. And uh, therapeutic dose means low molecular weight heparin, enoxaparin, 1 milligram per kilogram uh, BD. That is the therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin. And if the creatine clearance is less than 30, ideally go for unfractionate heparin or use 1 milligram per kilogram OD of enoxaparin. And unfractionate heparin, definitely uh, therapeutic dose means, you know, you go by 80 unit per kilogram bolus followed by 18 unit per kilogram per hour infusion. And uh, the most important thing is that when we are using enoxaparin, we don't have anything to monitor, especially in patients with renal failure or sub-pregnancy, obesity, etc. We are not monitoring the 10A levels. So in such categories, probably unfractionate heparin, we can at least look at the APDT levels and try to keep it at, say, between 55 to 75. That's important. And the rapid dose of apixaban is 5 milligram or 10 milligram BD and the broxaban is 15, 20 milligram OD. Now, the post-discharge thromboprophylaxis is actually very important. Recently, Lancet, they published a, a trial they said from the uh, Swedish registry. After following around, say, 90,000 patients, they said that there is increased risk of MI as well as uh, <clears throat> stroke in patients who have had COVID-19. Okay, so this post-discharge thromboprophylaxis actually becomes pretty important. And, uh, you know, we have not made any uh, difference uh, when, when compared to the previous guideline. You look at the, in any patients with a, a proven thrombus while in hospital, like, say, DVT or embolism, definitely you need to continue it for a longer period of time, say, three to six months with, the, say, warfarin, devoroxaban, or apixaban. But if the patient uh, never had any uh, <clears throat> definite thrombosis while in hospital, then you look at the modified venous thromboembolism score. And if the score is more than four, continue say, rivaroxaban or apixaban for two to three weeks. If the score is uh, more than or equal to two, and if the D-dimer is more than uh, two times the upper limit of normal, then also continue anticoagulation with NOAX for around, say, three weeks. So this is uh, the improved VT score. It is a, a point-based system. If there is a previous venous embolism, you get three points, a diagnosed thrombophilia, two points, lower limb paralysis, two points, malignancy, two points, immobilization for seven days, one point, stay in IC, one point, more than 60 years old, one point. So basically, when you are discharging a patient, you try to calculate the improved ET score, and then based on that, you can decide whether the patient requires uh, <coughs> post discharge from prophylaxis or not. So when to suspect embolism is uh, uh, just like the previous guidelines, so because the patient is in NIV, patient is not improving, patient is on ventilator, patient is not improving, uh, then consider pulmonary embolism. If there is a marked increase in D-dimer from the baseline, and if there is an acute worsening of oxygenation, blood pressure, tachycardia with, with, with imaging findings, which are not consistent with worsening due to COVID-19 pneumonia. So it is in that situation you think about embolism and take CTPA. So probably if you can't take a CTPA, as is the situation in the majority of the centers, then definitely go for therapeutic anticoagulation. Now, what are the contraindications to anticoagulation? The absolute contraindication is uh, platelet count less than 20,000. This is very, very important. The relative contraindication is platelet count less than 50,000, and then brain metastasis, recent major trauma, major abdominal surgery within the past 14 days, the GI or uh, uh, <coughs> gastrointestinal or genitourinary bleeding in the last 14 days, endocarditis, severe hypertension, that is uh, 200, systolic, diastolic, 120. Then uh, there are certain specific contraindications like for inoxaparin, non hypersensitivity to inoxaparin, heparin, or other low molecular weight heparin, so or if there is a history of immune mediated heparin dis thrombocytopenia within the past 100 days, then probably you should try to avoid using heparin or related drugs. If anticoagulant prophylaxis uh, cannot be given, then uh, you go for sequential compression device. So thank you very much for patient listening. So basically, uh, the, uh, the version four of this uh, protocol is. It's basically about uh, bringing down the mortality in uh, Kerala further by identifying the patients at the highest risk category and then uh, going with individualized treatment. treatment. And then uh, uh, all of you should actually, this is a big document, 130, because you know, certain drugs like say monoclonal antibodies, varsal, etc., we are not very familiar with the use of that. So we have uh, in, in depth, uh, you know, <clears throat> described how these drugs are to be used. Uh, how to means administer these monoclonal antibodies and what are the things to be side effects to be expected with baricitinib and all those things. And uh, MISC, MISA, all these things have been uh, discussed in detail in the in the document. And there is a separate section on pregnancy, what to do in pregnancy as well as you know, pregnancy critical care guidelines. You know, all the, the obstetricians are I mean, expected to go through those guidelines. And then regarding COVID associated mucormycosis and uh, astrogillosis, we have discussed in detail. And uh, you know the uh, how to approach those uh, entities, etc., are clearly described in the document. So thank you very much for patient listening.
sir can we start steroids to a patient with normal saturation with increased respiratory rate say 34 coming within 10 days of symptoms onset okay so actually uh <clears throat> gaitlin say that no hypoxia but then as you rightly said the patient is tachypneic that means that prob probably the patient is going into cytokine storm what we do in such situation is to do have access to uh, the SARS CoV 2 IgG. We look at that. If the IgG is negative, we proceed with monoclonal antibodies. Uh, category B fever on day 5 with high D dimer, 5 times normal than um, 5 times than normal, and no other symptoms. Is it justified to start anticoagulants? So basically, if that patient is hospitalized, we will start the more anticoagulants because we know that, you know, if you look at the the pathogenesis, there is always a risk of, uh, you know, activation of the coagulation cascade, etc. So, in a disease where, you know, the chance of getting, uh, say, arterial or venous thrombosis is high and the D-dimer is, uh, is more than five times the uh, uh, upper limit, uh, there is no harm in starting anticoagulation for that patient. Now, uh, what is the use of checking single breath count? Should we start steroids if SBC is low? Actually, the SBC, etc., were uh, in, in included as part of the empowered home care guidelines when, you know, we had uh, uh, number of cases in the state had passed our search capacity. Okay. Uh, that is when, you know, the patients in home care, we were not able to give, give them this oxygen beds ventilation at the earliest. That is when we insisted on this single breath count. Ideally, the patient should be looking at the, the pulse oximeter values. And if, if this if pulse oximeter is not available, then you can use a single breath count as a surrogate marker. So if it is ideally it should be more than 25. So if it is uh, so less than 15, it can be taken as a red flag sign and ideally it should be hospitalized at the, at the earliest. 15, 15 and 20, you take it as an yellow, yellow category and then probably you can start the patients on. If the patients are not willing to come for hospitalization, they can start the patient on home care. So it is actually applied only in a scenario where you know all our hospital beds are full. Ideally, all those patients should be hospitalized. Mm, patient presenting with chest pain, negative tropi, and no desaturation comes under which category? Uh, whether in category C or not. Uh, the thing is that we need to find the cause of that chest pain. You know, if you say costochondritis or anything like that, then probably you know, it, it won't fit into CAT C. Suppose you think that the chest pain is uh, related to, uh, say, a pneumonia, it's a pleuritic type of chest pain or it is uh, like a, uh, a cardiac type of chest pain, etc. probably that will fit into category C. We are getting COVID patients developed symptoms immediately after COVID vaccination and turns COVID positive in a week. Is there any change in treatment protocol for them? No, actually there is no change in uh, uh, COVID treatment protocol in vaccine also. This question usually comes when you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, patients, suppose a CKD patient uh, is fully vaccinated, is now coming with upper respiratory symptoms, you're doing the test and this COVID positive. Will you administer monoclonal antibody for such patients? That is the usual question because they are fully vaccinated. And the guidelines clearly state that irrespective of your vaccination status, you are supposed to give these monoclonal antibodies to patients with the highest risk. The, the, all other treatment modalities are, remains the same, irrespective of their vaccination status. There is only one change <clears throat> that is uh, <clears throat> recently US FDA did approve Caserumab uh, and Imdivumab for post-exposure prophylaxis. Okay, that is a patient with, uh, with a hematological stem cell transplantation or a CKD patient is getting higher exposure to COVID-19. Then even before developing uh, <coughs> COVID-19, they can be started on Caserumab and Imdivumab. But for that, US FDA specifies that they should not be vaccinated. Okay. Post-exposure prophylaxis should not be administered to patients who have been fully vaccinated or, uh, or patients who are unlikely to develop an antibody response following vaccination, like immunocompromised patients. In that situation, it becomes very, very important. But in India, uh, this uh, monoclonal antibody has not been licensed for post-exposure prophylaxis. Do we need to check IL-6 before tocilizumab? No, 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 no. IL-6 is not mandatory at all. If you look at the, the, the guidelines, it says that one is increasing oxygen requirement. That is, you no, know, you give, say, uh, steroids to act for, say, 24 hours, but then, you know, the hypoxia is not improving. Uh, patient is requiring, say, FA to 0.4 HFNO 30 liters per minute. So, irrespective of your inflammatory markers, you can proceed with uh, tocilizumab. Second indication is that there is a rapid clinical worsening with a CRP more than 75 
milligram per liter. So that is the recovery trial recommendation. Even in the recovery trial, they did not look at the IL-6 levels. But if you do have access to IL-6, you can use that also. Okay, it's not mandatory. Uh, so is Favipiravir out of our new guidelines, sir, now? It is out of our new guidelines. Does monitoring of D-dimer value have any role in deciding dur duration of anticoagulation? Actually, uh, none of the guidelines are based on the, the D-dimer levels, okay, because it is just based on the hypoxia aspect. So, hypoxia is there means there is an indication for anticoagulation. Moderate hypoxia, therapeutic. Severe, severe hypoxia, therapeutic. Critically ill, prophylactic or therapeutic. But then, suppose the patient is not improving, is clinically worsening. And if there is a five to six times upper uh, elevation of D-dimer levels, then you should uh, think, start thinking about an arterial or a venous thrombus. Okay, otherwise, based on the uh, D-dimer levels, there is no indication uh, to uh, change the dose of this anticoagulation. How can we treat cough in COVID-19? That's a common question, but... Okay, so actually, uh, the, the, the cough in COVID-19, the in initial part, initially you can get a cough and the in, in maybe after 10 days or so, you are going to get a, a bronchitis-like cough. Okay. The, usually the, the cough in the initial part is going to be a dry cough. So that can be taken care of by your bidicinide, MDI, 800 BD will take care of this, uh, the dry cough. The ne next is actually the, the cough which is persisting. That is after say 10 days or so, the, the dry, this, <coughs> uh, you know, what is in the reactive bronchitis like cough will be there. There are also the steroid uh, means MDIs might help. Then uh, this antihistamines with anticholinergic effect like the, the avil, etc. might help. Hypertropian nebulization also will, will help. Suppose it is persisting for longer periods of time, that is when we term it as uh, upper airway cough syndrome. The, the approach to upper airway cough syndrome is, first of all, try uh, antihistamines with anticholinergic activity, that is your avil, okay, phenyramine malate. Then uh, go with hypertropion. Then the, uh, go with steroid nebulization. If it is still not working, try oral steroids. Um, should we get oseltamivir to RT-PCR report waiting patient? Pregnancy, definitely give it. Uh, sir, in a CHC CSLTC setup, where we don't have injection heparin of, for anticoagulation, should we stick to tab aspirin instead of hypoxipation between SPO2 91 to 95? Actually, uh, uh, it means aspirin is not going to work because the recovery trial, the aspirin has been closed and there was no mortality benefit by giving aspirin. Uh, so, um, definitely uh, in, in a CLC setting, if you are managing hypoxic individuals, you should demand uh, on this uh, heparin. It's not a very uh, costly thing. We just need the intent for heparin. So, because it's a life-saving drug. Mm, will monoclonal antibodies destroy normal cells? This... Uh, Monoclonal antibodies, no, this is a non-competitive, uh, this thing, this will bind only to the receptor binding domain. So it is, uh, it will destroy the, uh, it's not destruction, it can lead to apoptosis or necrosis of the virus infected cells, because it can lead to antibody dependent cellular uh, cytotoxicity as well as complement dependent cytotoxicity. It, can, it will result in necrosis or apoptosis of the virus infected cells, not of the normal cells. Category A, Category B patients coming to OPD with reports of isolated D-dimer, high D-dimer value. Should we start them on anticoagulants? This is actually a very tricky situation. First thing is why D-dimer test was ordered for them. Usually we order D-dimer only for those patients who are having higher risk factors or hypoxic individuals. Okay. Having said that, there was a recent study which showed that even in those patients with mild to moderate disease, even after four months, okay, they are asymptomatic. Four months, 25 percent had elevated D-dimer levels. So, Actually, no recommendations can be made based on that. Having said that, suppose the patient is having, say, exertional dyspnea and the patient is having an elevated D-dimer, definitely that is a situation where you should take it pretty seriously. Um, what about pegylated uh, interferon 2 alpha? Okay, the question is about virafit. Uh, you know that the, in the soldati trial did have an arm on interferon stand. In the soldati trial, uh, you know, it was not found to be uh, beneficial. In IDSA, NIH, all these recommendations do not mention virafin. Uh, having said that, uh, the CD, uh, this thing, the DCGA approval is there for emergency use authorization of virafin for those patients with moderate to severe disease. Okay, it's not a part of the national protocol, and hence it's not a part of the state protocol. It's not a part of any protocol across the world. So WHO, IDSA, etc., do not recommend use of interferons. 
fully vaccinated high risk individuals in turn po uh, if turn positive and uh, whether antibody co cocktail is indicated or not that is what i said you know uh, antibody cocktail should not be uh, the, the decisions to give antibody cocktail should not be based on the vaccination status should be based on the risk assessment if the patient is having a very high risk of progression is so, uh, uh, that is very very important we say costly molecule so the number needed to treat should, should be justified so for that we should be able to pick up the higher highest risk you know category b diabetes is also category b but then diabetes per se uh, does not merit monoclonal antibody so it has to be hb1c more than 10 or patients with end organ damage like that so irrespective of the vaccination status if the patient's hb1c is more than 10 or the patient is having say diabetic retinopathy or say uh, you know <coughs> diabetic uh, uh, the kidney disease and all irrespective of the vaccination status they will benefit from monoclonal antibody cocktail if it is given in a timely fashion the other aspect of the question is that once you are given this monoclonal antibody when can you vaccinate the patient that is after 90 days um actually the from where we'll get this monoclonal antibody is a genuine question that we actually, need to actually we have been using this uh, uh, this monoclonal antibody for the last two months or so because there has been a government supply of this monoclonal antibody cocktail to all the major hospitals i believe that uh uh means uh, almost all the medical colleges will be having this monoclonal antibody cocktails and some selected district hospitals like kollam district hospital is having that and uh, the most important aspect is that it is to sensitize you to uh, this thing suppose you are having a ckd patient or uncontrolled diabetes patient you should think about the possibility of monoclonal antibody cocktail as well and you can uh, contact hospitals where the, it is available okay for example in trivandrum suppose in nayatingra hospital you are having a ckd patient uh is not in hypoxia has been diagnosed early you can send it to us and we can give monoclonal antibody cocktail and either admit them or send send them back or else you know you can think about redistribution of this monoclonal antibody cocktail based on your requirement from this major centers it can be say maybe around say five vials can be given to taluk hospital etc that can also be thought about yeah. can patients given baricitinib uh, be given tocilizumab <laughs> that's a very interesting question because the guidelines say that after tocilizumab baricitinib should not be given okay tocilizumab <laughs> okay the thing is uh, you know when we uh, think about uh, giving tocilizumab uh, means that we are actually in dire straits the patient is rapidly worsening that's the situation where we are thinking about tocilizumab i will say that even if the patient is on baricitinib if you think that there is an indication for giving intravenous tocilizumab go ahead with intravenous tocilizumab only thing is that don't continue with baricitinib uh have been observing many being positive after first dose within one week or two weeks is there be uh, is there by any chance of more susceptibility after first dose the thing is that the question is after uh, first dose now uh, many patients are getting diagnosed as covid 19 because you no know, uh, i don't have an answer for that if you are really interested in immunology read up read about original angenic sin and you will get the answer uh, heard about afi following first dose is there any valid info uh, on the same afi uh, following the first dose probably a uh, vaccination uh, that is actually any data on that a valid information regarding the same that is the question actually the afi is being uh, reported from the the you know to the by the district surveillance officer to the state afi committee and that process is actually going on i don't know what the uh, the person specifically mean by that you can actually ask that question uh, the talk is stressing more on antivirals just against many of the earlier studies uh, moreover is it suitable for indian scenario please clarify i did not say anything about antiviral no? so i think you uh, is mentioning about monoclonal antibody as an antiviral agent okay probably okay uh, means uh, if the question is with regard to uh, remdesivir remdesivir no we are not focusing on remdesivir at all only thing is that of the antivirals the only antiviral with at least some uh, means a very a very good quality trial supporting its use to bring down the hospitalization by at least 3 days is remdesivir that's all i think the question is about monoclonal antibody cocktail and how cost effective it is going to be that is a very very important question if you look at the the indications given in the state protocol it is not the indications approved by you know the uh, the manufacturer or uh, by dcgi we are actually hand picking those with the highest risk of progression 
so that we can bring down the number needed to treat. Having said that, no, it is one intervention which has been uh, uh, proved by uh, very good studies, which can bring down the hospitalization by 70 days. And USFD approval is there, there even for post exposure prophylaxis. Okay. So we should not be denying the, the patients who are at highest risk of progression uh, to severe disease monoclonal antibody because of logistical issues. Okay, that is why now we have put it under the guidelines. Having said that, we need to handpick the patients, right? Uh, patients should be given monoclonal antibodies. It is not a diabetic patient or a hypertensive patient. Okay, and uh, uh, the criteria uh, who will benefit was based on our mortality analysis data as well. I agree to him in a country like India, whether you know it is cost effective, there is another way of looking at it. In Kerala, it may not be applicable because majority of the patients are in government sector. Suppose if the patient is in a private sector and if you're a diabetic and if you're end up in ICU, you know, what is the 60,000 rupees? Okay, that is how I think we should be looking at it in another way. Uh, for moderate category patients on aspirin, do you still recommend therapeutic dose of molecular heparin? So the, actually, the it's not about me recommending. It's about the, the evidence. Okay, it's not. I am I'm not recommending it. So uh, you know, almost all the you know, following delta variant there has been increased risk of arterial as well as venous thrombosis. And there is something known as the India COVID guidelines by the Infectious Society of India. So that actually stress upon therapeutic dose anticoagulation for those with moderate or severe disease. But for critically ill, the risk of bleeding is also equally high. So in that category, say probably prophylactic or therapeutic, the, the clinician can decide. Okay. Uh, is hemoptysis associated with COVID a contraindication for continuing heparin? Depends on uh, what is causing this hemoptysis. Suppose the hemoptysis is due to pulmonary embolism, then it becomes an absolute indication for continuing heparin. You need to identify the cause of hemoptysis. Uh, should we follow the uh, same strategy for patients presenting with pneumonia and hypoxia after an after a uneventful quarantine period? Definitely. After an uneventful quarantine period. Quarantine okay. period. Okay, Not okay. documented COVID. Probably can be... be. Uh, that also we need to uh, find why the patient is developing this pneumonia. I believe that it's a COVID-19 because the patient has been in quarantine and has come with uh, you know, pneumonia after 17 days. No, that's isolation period. Okay, you need to identify the cause of pneumonia. So, uh, probably it is likely to be due to COVID pneumonia and uh, the worsening due to that. Follow the protocol. Uh, what is the indication of prophylactic dose of anticoagulation? So in critically ill, uh, uh, the, the guidelines say that at least the patient should be put on at least prophylactic dose anticoagulation and if possible, the rapid dose anticoagulation for moderate to severe disease. In critically ill, uh, 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 prophylactic dose anticoagulation if the risk of bleeding is actually higher. Okay. Uh, sir, indication for uh, prophylactic anticoagulation already discussed. Please edit. Uh, if a category B2 pregnant patient gets admitted to the hospital, for how many days should you give heparin? Is it applicable only in third trimester? Okay. Uh, the problem here is that uh, NOAX cannot be given in pregnancy or lactation. So if you want to give anticoagulation, it has to be heparin only. So that is actually the question. And uh, regarding uh, the dosage of anticoagulation in pregnancy and all, uh, we have not changed the, the you know, the FOX3 guidelines because uh, therapeutic dose anticoagulation for moderate to severe disease in pregnancy has to be taken by the gynecologist. Uh, you need to look up the risk of bleeding and all those things and the timing of cesarean section, etc. So basically, at least prophylactic dose has to be given. And if you feel that the dose has to be continued, uh, for say 14 days, it has to be continued because we don't have an oral alternative. The uh, NOAX cannot be given in pregnancy. And another aspect is the D dimer levels. We cannot uh, rely on D dimer levels in pregnancy because in third trimester, say the D dimer up to 3.3 can be taken as normal. So basically, we need to individualize in pregnancy. Is there any role of oral steroids for home isolated patients? I think uh, the video ideally, is uh, the thing is, uh, you, know, you can look at the empowered home care guidelines. The empowered home care guidelines is not about starting steroids for everyone. It was, you know, it was in a situation where, you know, uh, there was a dearth of, of the oxygen beds and all those things. You know, there was a delay in getting oxygen beds. In such situations, you know, we categorize the patient to red and uh, the yellow category. So red category needs immediate hospitalization. Yellow category means that you can start them on home steroids till you get the hospital bed. So the idea is not about starting oral steroids at home. The idea is about getting those patients to hospital at the earliest, especially those patients, uh, diabetic patients and all. 
they don't have access to glucometer etc being in home care is going to be detrimental uh, sir i have one of the questions sir uh, doubt sir one thing is sir, uh, regarding monoclonal antibody uh, can we give that for uh, chronic lung uh, especially that cld copd patient if the hypoxia is due to basic lung disease can can we give uh, monoclonal antibody for such patients definitely madam there is a guideline says that it, if there is no worsening of oxygen requirement there is no increase oxygen requirement we can definitely consider suppose the saturation is 85 and after covid also saturation is remaining 85 you can consider within certain days of development of disease one more doctor uh, that is that uh, regarding jack inhibitors uh, uh, actually the guideline uh, recommends that in uh, category b and category c patients so that patients will be i, I mean category c moderate and severe case but for that patients remdesivir is also there so uh, can we the remdesivir rather than using as a mono uh, therapy uh, so what is that okay ma'am means ma ma the question is that uh, the usually the fda approval was for remdesivir plus baricitinib that is the yes. question right okay yes, uh, madam couple of days back they did give approval for baricitinib alone they are losing their faith in remdesivir okay mm-hmm. and then uh, one more was out sir so uh-huh. we are getting so many patients in the post covid uh, that is uh, with the elevated ddm and uh, most of them will be having respiratory symptoms also so some of them will be having uh, like ddm around 2 or 3 uh, values maybe it's very high so uh, can we continue this uh, drug for another maybe up to 6 weeks can we continue madam that a uh, decision yeah, should be individualized because majority of these patients uh, means no on home oxygen etc you know their mobility etc is limited so giving it for 6 weeks etc is not going to harm them uh, but then there are no guidelines saying that you no know, based on ddimer if there is no evidence of a definite thrombosis you should continue beyond 3 weeks uh, but still uh, in uh, in your situation i means no uh, in, the, in, the, in the scenario we discussed there is no harm in continuing madam dr joseph uh... so i had heard about uh, two afis uh, following first dose of vaccination uh, i'm not sure whether it's valid uh, but can you give uh, is there any uh, valid statement about afis following first dose or second dose uh, sir, sir actually afi means it is actually a broad category no means uh, what or uh, exactly what afi did you come across no so uh-huh. like uh, i contact uh, one of my friends told me that uh, one of his friends had taken the vaccine uh, and following that uh, she had two days of fever with muscle aches and uh, she is also a patient of ulcerative colitis so yeah. along with that she had fever and uh, loose uh, means uh, the side effects of uh, uh, but it was in a greater much deep than the normal uh, yeah. fever So actually, we classify this AFIs into minor AFIs, major AFIs, serious, and all those things. The patient does not require hospitalization; it will be minor AFI only. We know that following uh, this, you no, know, uh, uh, the COVID shield vaccination, you are likely to get these flu-like symptoms and all these things for around four days or so. So that is a minor AFI only. The the serious uh, events will be the ones like say uh, vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia with thrombosis and say Guillain-Barré syndrome and all those things. Uh, actually the you know the the incidence of those events are actually pretty rare you know, compared to the risk of covid 19 the risk of serious afi is less minor afi there are a lot of minor afi so uh, like when they ask the questions that uh, is it a uh, indication not to take the vaccination no no definitely uh, ne- definitely because we know that out of say 1 lakh population one person is likely to get this vaccine this thrombocytopenia with thrombosis no Okay. but when you look at the risk of thrombosis following covid 19 definitely the vaccine is going to protect them so we should actually encourage them to take vaccination even pregnancy and lactation why we are pushing for vaccination because we know that in the first wave in the, in, a, in the first wave in the pregnancy the only seven uh, pregnant ladies died second wave there are, there are around 43 deaths till now okay that is why you know we push for uh, aggressive vaccination even in pregnancy so it is all, everything is about risk versus benefit so whatever be the side effects due to vaccination we have a strong argument for supporting vaccination in any patient category you just look at the uk data so following the alpha wave their case fatality was 1.9 and now following the delta wave they have totally opened up uk no in despite having the most virulent uh, in the, the virus and with the transmission advantage of around 64% more than 
alpha virus viral load thousand times more than alpha but still their case fatality is only 0.2 what is the difference between alpha wave of uk and delta wave of uk during the alpha wave their vaccination was less than 30 percentage during the delta wave their vaccination is more than 70 percentage that is actually the strongest real world argument for aggressive vaccination so there's three questions one is many patients are complaining about insomnia uh, after this covid even uh, post covid they're saying that many cannot so we have tried i've given night rest like solpidum even quetiapine has been given and still there has been no benefit any what, what's the connection with covid and insomnia what treatment can be given actually you know, this is actually a well known entity and usually majority of these patients will start developing insomnia after 10 days or so okay so there is a term itself known as a covid insomnia and luckily it affects females more okay in modalities as you mentioned trying out the benzodiazepines solpidem melatonin all these things might work to a particular extent but i uh, you know i have uh, means when i talk about this using benzodiazepines etc the my psychiatry friends usually say that that is a specialty field refer to that they will manage okay okay so one question and the question was many people after 17 days of the usual quarantine of the corona they come with chest congestion <coughs> lot of chest congestion and uh, they have a lot of cough so initially it's a lot of avil and things have been given itself but uh, uh, for those patients when we check ldh serum ferritin the inflammatory markers those are elevated but d dimer is normal like crp is elevated ldh is elevated serum ferritin is uh, elevated so those patients should be managed with anticoagulants and uh, oral steroids what is your the thing is that in 17 days you know we need to see uh, why this is occurring is it a part of because acute covid 19 can extend up to one month so we need to see whether it is actually a part of sars cov 2 pneumonia itself whether the inflammatory process is going on second aspect is actually patient might have had a mild covid 19 and following uh, you know uh, the mucociliary clearance as well as the integrity of the mucus etc would have lost and patient could have had a secondary bacterial pneumonia which is actually less when compared to influenza so in such a situation also the other inflammatory markers will be elevated because these are non specific crp ldh i won't say because ldh is a marker of hypoxia only ldh will elevate yes. in such a situation uh, probably if you think that is a bacterial super infection you know an antibiotics are likely to help you don't go for steroids at that point of time think about steroids if you think that there is a uh, is a, a disease continuum is there then in that scenario think about this thing having said that it's very difficult at the ground level it's very difficult because covid 19 the inflammatory phase itself is having three phases now there is the early inflammatory is there there the hyper inflammatory is there and then there is a late inflammatory phase as well so it is uh, basically we need to individualize okay But and uh, even though it's been elevated that's why yeah 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 it late elevated means that there is a sort of a hypoxia or something is going on there is important so ldh uh, i told about antibiotics now we should not be using antibiotics in covid 19 in, in the initial phase okay that is during the phase of viral replication after 17 days or so if you are thinking that there is a bacterial super infection there is no harm in using antibiotics so third question is in our chc phc setups we have a lot of data on the ckd cld patients uh, moderately i mean largely obese and things like that we come across them on a regular basis so if we keep a data on those patients and if they become positive like a ckd patient on hemodialysis should they should we refer them to medical college for a monoclonal antibody that is actually basically our aim because no i know from your experience also we know it's very difficult to save the ckd patients once they become covid positive you know our mortality is around 30% uh, i don't think that with the, with the other strategies we will be able to save them the only way will be to identify them at the earliest and give them monoclonal antibodies okay like the previous uh, uh, the doctor asked are we justified in bringing this monoclonal antibody into these guidelines the only way in which we can save ckd patients or cld patients or patients on uh, chemotherapy etc is by including monoclonal antibody that is not to misuse this monoclonal antibody we need to identify the right pa patients who are likely to benefit from monoclonal antibody it is very tough to educate these patients who say they are fine they say we don't have any cough we don't have anything but we are just ckd and with they became asymptomatically they are positive so to push those patients to come it's for actually a, uh, it's very difficult because you now we have been having this problem over the last two months because Uh, emergency use authorization means you need to have an informed consent okay so informed consent means it is is difficult you know uh, we are saying that it's an experimental drug it might uh, you know uh, be of help to you and we are talking to a patient who is totally asymptomatic like you said ckd we are going to say that kerala data says that 
uh, by eighth day you are going to develop pneumonia and only 70% you will serve of you will survive 30% is going to die they want to buy this argument okay that is a problem so by uh, by including it under the, the the protocol probably that is going to dispel some fear you no know? it's there in the protocol that is why you know we thought about bringing it in the protocol i don't think that any other state guidelines do include this protocol because you know our aim you know when we are going uh, means uh, and after one and a half years we don't have other strategies to save ckd patients okay we have actually miserably failed in this group ckd patients cld patients hematological malignancies these are the people who are likely to benefit from this monoclonal antibodies and we should actually reserve this monoclonal antibodies for the highest risk category but convincing them is going to be tough and probably you must must have read about allegations now regarding monoclonal antibody use like we are giving only to say doctors doctors relatives vips etc why this is coming because the others are not are reluctant to sign the informed consent that is the problem we are using this monoclonal antibodies in pregnancy as well because in an obese lady 35 that means bmi more than 35 pre eclampsia gdm is actually a recipe for disaster if you are getting an opportunity now to give monoclonal antibody give it okay so one last question sir uh, sir uh, some recent studies have come out saying the leukemia patients uh, uh, are having some problems while taking this vaccination so is that valid uh, for uh, our covid shield and covaxin Uh, some recent studies from abroad had come out saying that leukemia patients should not be vaccinated, or rather, there are a lot of side effects. So, any data regarding that? Actually, uh, I mean, I am not aware of that. What What was the side effect? Ah, uh, like lot of thro- uh, bleeding manifestations, lot of the leukemia worsening, things like that. Actually, I am not aware of it. Uh, I, uh, the basic concept is that all these patients should be vaccinated. are there any i don't think that any you I know mean, the who or this fda you know, or you know, european medical agency have not issued an alert with regard to this no ideally they still maintain that this patient should be vaccinated yeah. okay thank thank you